you ever wish you could go out on epic gravel rides and have an amazing spread of food at your lunch stop and at the end of each day? Well, in this video, I'm going to interview Xander of The Cyclist Menu, whose business does just that. If you haven't heard of The Cyclist Menu, it's a company that operates week-long bike trips, and they've really embraced the whole gravel riding adventure cycling market, and they run a whole series of what they call gravel camps. One thing that's really unique about what they do is Xander is a chef, and he really brings that to the forefront of the business. He specializes in sourcing local ingredients wherever they're hosting the camp. In this interview, we talk about the ups and downs of running a small business, how he finds local farmers to work with, and also, uh, learn more about his gravel camps. This episode of PLP Talks is made possible by listeners and viewers like you, and it's also supported by the Art of Survival Century bike ride. You can learn more about them at survivalcentury.com. The Survival Century takes place on the weekend of May 26, and it's actually a whole weekend of bike fun. On that Saturday, there is a paved Century ride as well as a metric Century, and on that Sunday, there is a whole slew of gravel grinding events, even a 72 mile gravel grinder to distances that are a little bit more family friendly. And all these rides take place around the Lava Beds National Monument, which is full of petroglyphs and pictographs, Lots of cool pictures for your Instagram feed. So learn more about them at survivalcentury.com. So with all that said, put on your earbuds. If you're watching this on YouTube, enlarge it full screen. Pretend like you're working at your desk. It's okay, we won't tell. And enjoy the show. So today we've got Xander, uh, Chef Xander actually. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Russ. It's great to be here. Cool. So for those that aren't familiar with the Cyclist Menu, can you just give us like a brief history of how how you guys started? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Heidi and I have spent a combined 15 years working in the industry from a travel perspective. Uh, destination cycling, mostly triathlon and road cycling for a long time. Heidi as a mountain bike guide in Moab as well as uh, across the country. And uh, she had a pretty lengthy professional MTB career as well on the cross country circuit. Um, but Myself as a chef and directing camps for a couple other companies in the past in Tucson in the winter, it was a place that really became, felt like home. Um, and uh, after wanting to do more with uh, our our own selves as, as chefs and as guides and as coaches, uh, we chose to move to Boulder in 2015 and actually started finding these networks of gravel roads um, leading here, leading there, and it became uh, the style of riding that we that we wanted to do more of. And so we looked at each other and said, we said, you know, we should we should consider hosting a week long gravel event mm -hmm. um, and look at it from a from a camp and and, a, and an adventure standpoint for people to sign up and come be with us and uh, in beautiful places. Cool. So for uh, for those that aren't super familiar with what you guys do. So you host week-long camps that travel, right? You pick different destinations. They're largely around gravel. Um, and you guys, you, you do all the cooking. We do, yeah. Uh, having spent so many years in the wintertime in Tucson, it's such a great place to ride during the winter for the rest of the country to come and get some sunshine, obviously. Uh, you know you've been here before. Uh, right now, I think it's 80 degrees outside, and it has Dang been it. for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been primo. People, you know, local Tucsonians are kind of blown away right now by the January weather. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we search out we we push ourselves to find uh, unique locations uh, around the country and the world, uh, places where we're finding that the riding is spectacular and, and off the beaten path and in the middle of nowhere, but uh, maybe where um, some other touring companies or adventure-based cycling companies haven't gone yet. Mm -hmm. um, but a big big piece in, in criteria for that is finding locations that have really strong agricultural networks so that we can connect ourselves, uh, our brand, as well as our clients to the food network and give them uh, a, a feeling like they're going home having really known that place. Right. versus just going somewhere to ride their bike. All right. Cool. So when you, so it sounds like you guys do largely gravel. Is that right? We do. Yeah, we're focusing heavily on gravel, uh, especially in the United States. We have one road cycling destination right now, which is Mallorca, Spain in the spring. So has that been 
kind of a a hard sell because in some ways like gravels always or seems to have come from like a DIY community and not necessarily um you know the the audience that would pay for like a supported tour do you find that that's changing or has it just been easy to to find riders that are willing to do it you bring up an awesome question uh it's something it's something we chat about all morning over coffee and probably yeah. all night over beer um yeah. I would say it's probably pretty evenly spit right now in, in the community that is riding longer endurance gravel. Um, I think one of the most unique things about gravel riding, uh, two things really, uh, you can you can really get away from the traffic, which is obviously posing a huge issue in the States and then you know around the world right now for road cyclists. People are moving more and more away from the sport in, in many ways, not for any particular reason, but we're seeing it happen faster and uh, at, a, at a high rate right now. Um, the other one is that it, it offers the ability to feel the comfort of a road bike style of ride, um, but it it's not as hard or as challenging or maybe as daunting for someone who hasn't mountain biked before mm-hmm. or who feels like they um, might be at an age where mountain biking uh, is something that they're not willing to to put the time and effort into. And so when you get on a gravel bike or a cross bike, something that has larger clearance for a little bit of a wider tire, uh, it, it gives people a lot of confidence in the ability to get out into the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, that DIY crowd though, is definitely someone that, uh, we look to for support. And, um, I think those are the folks that are seemingly more and more wanting to sign up for these style of adventures just because of the events that are popping up across the country like the dk dirty mm-hmm. kansas land run 100 uh belgian waffle ride rest Boutitsa in vermont mm-hmm. uh, these events are cropping up everywhere they're incredible and they're i think they're really bringing the the community of adventurers closer together yeah yeah it's interesting because it's kind of a like uh in some of the work that we do uh, around the space of bike tourism, like we, I don't know if you guys know about the bike tourism um, conference, it brings together events and destinations. We've presented there a bunch of times. And over the last couple of years, we've been telling them, you have to look at gravel. You have to look at gravel. It's going to be, you know, it's, it's not just the next big thing. It is the big thing. Um, and there's a couple of businesses that have gone out uh, on a limb trying to do that. Um, but from they're they're still finding that audience that likes gravel, but is willing to pay like a road cyclist. Because <laughs> it seems yeah. as if like in some ways, yeah, this idea of a you know all inclusive like fully supported uh, ride is nothing new to roadies, but in terms of like the gravel audience, um, it's still not I don't know it's still not something that a lot of people are seeing um, that that they should pay for it or or something. Yeah, it's it's a challenge that we face, uh, and I think we'll continue to face it. I think something that's interesting to to watch for us is uh, the technology of the bikes that that are beginning to hit the market. Um, you know, there's obviously a price point for all of these bikes. And I think that that will, will continue to allow more and more people to get into the genre of cycling, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. But I think that the beauty of what this genre of cycling does provide is only going to up the ante for many small bike companies and making such beautiful things to ride on. Yeah. Um, and so I think, people will continue to have the opportunity to invest in it as much as they feel Mm -hmm. necessary or that they want to, um, similar to road biking, similar to mountain biking. Uh, and one thing that we're seeing in the industry from a gravels perspective with the events that are cropping up, but also from the cyclist menu's point of view is how do we cultivate uh, our own culture? How do, how do we, how do we bring together this larger gravel family? We call it. Uh, and Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what's, what people will begin to want to invest in, um, and pay money for when traveling with their bike is to be a part of that family, to be a part of that culture. Um, and that story ultimately versus, you know, like kind of what I mentioned earlier is, you know, you can, anyone can travel anywhere in the world to ride their bicycle, but, when they go home feeling truly connected to something, that's that's the magic. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, going through your website, and you've got this great short video uh, where you kind of highlight working with local farmers at the destinations you work with. And for me, I think that's like a really unique kind of value proposition. Um, instead of feeling like, you know, you're kind of just catered to and are in this moving circus that doesn't like touch any parts of the community, I feel like, you know, that's an awesome kind of a value add that 
that that you add in your your philosophy thanks uh, <laughs> it's 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 literally the foundation of what we do uh when Heidi asked me if I wanted to go into business with her two and a half years ago, I said, hands down, yeah, let's do this. Totally psyched. But we have to look at it. Uh, I believed, and we and we both still believe this now, is that we have to look at it from a chef's perspective where a food network is is the basis of life. It is, it is literally what we need to survive, and it is what communities can thrive off, whether you're small or large, in so many beautiful ways. And so we wanted to establish ours off of that and do it wherever we operate. Um, mm-hmm. Having having spent so many years now in a row in Tucson in the wintertime, it's amazing because the agriculture system here is operating similar to the rest of the country during the summer. And so it's really neat to see the flip-flop and to have guests come from, let's say, the cold north of Wisconsin to Tucson for a week of riding, and they're like, oh, my God, you know, I haven't had greens like this since July, or you know, where'd you guys get these vegetables? And so it's a really wonderful flip-flop seasonally, but it's also uh, been a really incredible community to dive into agriculturally because the desert is such a unique place. Um, it's it's looked at as dead across so many different ways, but in fact, it's such a, it's such an alive place to be. Yeah, as you know, as you know. <laughs> so how do you how do you find these local these small local providers, and like what's what's the reaction when you tell them that you know you're a chef and you're going to be it's specifically for this cycling group? Are they like, whoa, what's that about? Or are they pretty excited? Or what's the reaction? Initially, their reaction is uh, they're pretty excited. Uh, I think normally they aren't contacted by someone like myself. Uh, maybe it's an individual that lives locally or it's, uh, it might be a market in Tucson or it might be a market in Mendocino, California or in Missoula, mm-hmm. Montana, for that instance. Uh, you know, it might be someone who's interested in selling retail, uh, but they are, they're always excited. Uh, I think what we have, what we offer as a, as a six, six day all inclusive cycling experience, um, immediately they're kind of blown away like wait wait a second what are you guys doing and and for how many days how many people yeah. and uh a lot of them too are blown away with the amount of food that cyclists can consume over the course of five days so uh how we find these people is is a wonderful question i sometimes ask myself the same <laughs> one uh i definitely do my research uh there's 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 points at which in each community that i'm often looking for to go to to say you know, hey, where might I look for this? Or have you heard of someone doing this locally? And I, you know, I use those keywords and it ends up getting me usually to the dead end of some dirt road at a farm that has a gate where I need to like walk around to the back and go find the ranch manager or something like that. But yeah. uh, it's been beautiful. Cool. Are these, are these communities and these people excited to see cyclists in, in their area? Yeah. Uh, we're looking for places that definitely have some history in cycling. So I think that the, that people riding bikes in most of the places that we're either looking to do R and D for future trips in, or already have done a trip in art, you know, it's not totally abnormal to see people riding a bike, but, um, you know, speaking specifically about the Patagonia Sonoida region, uh, of Southern Arizona, which is where we operate gravel camp during the, during the winter months in Arizona, um, we're 60 miles South of Tucson, and it's a 300 year old ranching community and although there's a lot of bike touring through there both you know done individually by by anyone who chooses but um a few local outfits as well um it's such a vast landscape it's so wide open and it's such a small community that unless you put the time in to really research and find out who's there and who's operating uh you wouldn't you wouldn't otherwise find it yeah, uh, I think that they're really excited to see the level of tourism that's beginning to come in that is recreationally based, whether it be running or hiking or, or riding a bike. Yeah, we, we got to explore uh, Patagonia a little bit last winter. And I mean, we were just blown away by the potential for that area in terms of like being an outdoor recreation base camp. You know, it's like they've got all these great assets, especially in terms of gravel riding. I mean, there just seems like a, a ton of roads and not that much traffic and um, you know, it seems like there's a, a lot of opportunity to, to kind of 
really developed that area as a hotspot for, for gravel riding. <laughs> I know. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it yeah. so much on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, Heidi and I can't speak more highly about it. Uh, you know, we we we're our headquarters now. We've moved from Colorado to Tucson, and we love this community. It's a great place to base out of to to operate gravel camp down in Patagonia in the San Rafael Valley. Um, but we wake up every morning wishing that we were just there. Right. Uh, the coolest part about Patagonia and Sonoida is that it, it, it is at the right at the mouth of gravel country down there. Um, mm-hmm. It's the start to everything. And uh, there's four huge prominent mountain ranges, and you can ride your bike around almost all of them. Uh, and the views are, are huge. You're, you're overlooking the border of Mexico almost all day. Uh, and we call, we're so lucky to call the Santa Rita Mountains like kind of our mountain range. Uh, Mount Wrightston sits just under 10,000 feet, if you can believe it. Mm-hmm. And it is the biggest landmark in the entire valley. Not only can you see it from everywhere in Tucson, but it's just looming on every ride down in the center of Fell. It's, it's so beautiful. And you're right there. There's almost no traffic except for a couple of ranch trucks. And mm-hmm. the Border Patrol guys are out there managing the roads. So the quality is incredible. And they're usually pretty awesome. We haven't had any yeah. problems with them. Um, we throw them a few granola bars and a PB and J every once in a while, and they just keep on rolling. What's the difference between the gravel cyclists you host and and the pure readies that you host, or are they similar? I think we're starting to see uh, really similar clients across the board. Yeah. Uh, I think we've, you know, being two and a half years in, we've created a brand. We've created. Uh, we're getting closer to establishing what our culture is every day. Um, my mom just asked me that same question over <laughs> Christmas, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, and I think that, you know, people are excited to travel with us, uh, maybe more about uh, for our food than just the riding necessarily, which uh, I feel so lucky and honored to, to have that be the case. Um, it speaks heavily to the food networks that we're operating with i i i can't do i can't build my menus without the farmers and the ranchers which is incredibly cool Mm -hmm. and i love talking about them and sharing their stories but um well the reason why we love going to mallorca in april and may is it offers a very similar experience to the san rafael valley in arizona in the winter time the style of riding the ability to get on your bike in the morning and really not have to worry about anything until the sun goes down Mm -hmm. Uh, it, the island is so designed to ride a bike, um, and it's so interactive and engaging in so many ways uh, and culturally rich uh, that it's just a great place to travel to and to experience. Uh, really, the only thing that changes is the road service, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, we're, what we're what's neat is we're seeing more and more, even for people riding road bikes, is they're going to wider tire options. <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of fun to see this transition and to to be a part of it on the gravel scene, but to also see it happening from a road perspective as well. Yeah, it's it's hilarious that like I don't know the the shift in like tire tire width sizes has been like pretty amazing. You know, like now it's like twenty eight thirty is becoming the norm for for most road bikes, and it's been fascinating to watch. Um, you know historically like high-end road bike brands and base uh embrace like gravel riding or adventure biking and create you know disc brake bikes with you know tire tire width uh up to like 40 millimeters and, and everything <laughs> oh it's awesome i mean i you know our chief ambassador for the cyclist menu his name's yuri hoswald i'm sure you've heard his name before <laughs> uh, i think he rode the tour of California course last year on a pair of thick slicks that were like 32s. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, he's rolling with a crew that is putting down serious miles on a daily basis and fast. Yeah. So I think for, for anyone looking for more comfort and just a a different ride style, I think that even the road bikes are going larger and it's going to continue to happen. Definitely. Yeah. Um, do you find people that are interested in your gravel offerings are younger than people that are interested in the road? Is there, like, what, what's a differentiator? Or is it, there's just things spilling over? It, it's starting to spill over quite, quite a bit. Uh, I would say we, we, uh, the cyclist menu offers more options on an annual basis right now for gravel riding than road. So we're seeing a larger gamut at, at, at cycle, at gravel camp, excuse me. Um, and obviously financially to go to Europe and to, 
commit to a, a week of cycling with with an outfit like ours um it's not it, it it's not the cheapest thing in the world it, you know you got to buy your plane ticket mm. etc travel with your bike if not there's a rental fee associated but um i think we're seeing it become something that is approachable by many uh you know we've done enough of our research at this point into financially what it takes to host these style of events and then what it takes for people to travel and to you know get away from their family and their work for a week or more 10 days sometimes especially if you're going to europe and that that's a that's a big commitment personally whether they're by themselves or with their loved one or a friend Mm -hmm. um and uh you know, domestically at Gravel Camp, we're definitely seeing a large uh, group of people who are in their mid 30s to mid 40s, which is great. Um, Heidi and I worked in the in the high end road and triathlon scene for a number of years, like I said, and uh, those age groups were uh, they were kind of outliers at that point. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's been really fun to uh, adventure and ride and eat with people who are you know doing well for themselves uh, at mm-hmm. 35 and 38 and 42 and 45 who have young families. Pretty mm-hmm. cool. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about the food since it's such a big component. Like what is, um, you know, what does a menu look like when, when someone goes on a uh, gravel camp? Great question. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely like to dictate my menus um, as seasonally and, and as, as opportunistic as possible. Uh-huh. Uh, more and more we're, we're working with only what we can get. And the fun part about that is sometimes you don't have a choice. Uh, and sometimes, you know, at this point now in Arizona at gravel camp, uh, I can look at my producers. Uh, we work with a couple different farms here in this area and say, you know, I'm really excited about these, 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 these produce items. Um, you know, what can we do? What quantities can we do for this season? So we're getting to a point now where we can build that out with them and, and allow them to know exactly what we need and what we're interested in having. It also gives them an opportunity maybe to focus more on one thing if that's seeming like something they want to go forward with or uh, or something new, which is really cool as a, as a chef to work mm-hmm. with a farmer on something brand new for them. Um, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in general, our, our menus... Uh, uh, we, we start vegetarian and vegan almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, because we eat family style every night, uh, everything's laid out, you know, on the table, people are asking, can you pass this? Can you pass that? It's really interactive. Um, there's proteins, there's, there's sides, there's sauces always available for people, whether they want them or not. Uh, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a plate or a bowl coming and being put in front of everyone saying, you know, Sorry guys, this is what you have tonight. No, it's uh, it's actually <laughs> it's more creative in that sense. I like to I like to come up with an item for dinner or lunch or breakfast, but allow everyone at the table to kind of uh, mix and match and make them feel really associated with what they're eating too. Right. Do you how much um, how much information do you give people about where the food comes from when they're when they're on a um, on a tour with you guys? As much as I can. Uh, I'll tell the story of, of each producer in, you know, many different ways. Uh, we have some really lengthy relationships with some, and then we have, uh, some much shorter ones with others, whether it be, uh, you know, someone who we just met this season, uh, 2018, or if it's someone we've been working with for a couple of years, obviously that relationship's a little bit more extensive and the story gets a little bit longer, uh, even to the point where that, that food producer, that rancher, that baker, that brewer, um, you know, they might come down and, and join us for a dinner one mm-hmm. night during the week, which is really, really fun for people to meet those folks. Uh, last year, uh, what, something that was really, really neat to do for guests is uh, we pick everyone up at the airport or their respective hotel in Tucson, and we, we bring them down to Patagonia to start, to start the week of riding. And uh, upon picking everyone up and coming back down to the San Rafael Valley, Heidi stops into where we buy all of our chickens and our eggs for the week. Mm -hmm. And they haven't even, our guests haven't even gotten to the house yet. They haven't even unpacked and they're already walking into a small farm in Sonoda, Arizona, probably feeling way out of their element in many ways, having just got off the airplane and they're picking up their produce and (laughs) some of their protein and their fresh eggs for the week. Uh, So right off the bat, we're giving people a pretty impactful moment. 
um, to realize the importance of a food network, where their food's coming from for the week, and uh, you know, just introducing them to our way of life in many ways. Right. Uh, Heidi and I, Heidi and I, at the beginning of every week of Gravel Camp, we say, you know, welcome to the family. You know, you're now here. Uh, we've been emailing with you for months, but uh, you know, now now this is your time to to put your feet up. Have a great time, ride your butt off, do whatever you you please for the next six days. Right, cool. Where do most people come from? Is it uh, people domestically that that live in winter, or are you getting more uh, international guests as well? Right now, uh, a lot of you know, I'd say ninety nine percent or ninety five percent somewhere in there is uh, all domestic. Um, definitely colder environments are coming to visit mm-hmm. Tucson in the winter time. Uh, but that's everything from um, Alaska uh, to Georgia. Uh, we've got people from the Midwest, California, Colorado. Uh, it's a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's hard to say. Some people, you know, a few Canadians here and there. Uh, no one really yet traveling to this part of Tucson from Arizona specifically. But we've had a lot of interest in many ways. So it just it it, it comes and goes. Yeah. How, how long is uh, how long are the rides every day, or do you cater that specifically to like the the skill level of the group? We cater to the skill level of the group definitely. Uh, on arrival day, uh, we call it sh- the shakedown spin. Uh, so everyone arrives to camp. We have a beautiful lunch. Everyone unpacks, gets comfortable, uh, and then we head out for just about a two to a two and a half hour spin. It's anywhere from. 25 to 35 miles, depending on how everyone's feeling, whether or not people just literally got off the airplane a couple hours prior. Uh, but it's a time to shake the legs out, um, get people associated with the rental bike if they did rent one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a moment for us as staff and and our team, our lead guides to, you know, get acquainted with how people ride their bike and kind of maybe how the rest of the week is going to go. It's always a really good indicator. But generally, generally we focus on uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 miles a day. Uh, everything is fully SAG supported. And so, you know, anyone has the option to ride or as little as long as they want. And then our staff is equipped with the ability to provide extra miles or not, depending on how everyone's feeling during each day. Right. Cool. So I was looking at your calendar. It looked like you were doing something with a, um, someone we've had on the show, Jay Peterberry. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> Jay Peterberry and I go back a ways. We're actually uh, really good buddies. Uh, we both worked. We both worked at Fitzgerald's Bicycles in Idaho together. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Jay and I quickly became friends. We started riding together and have since just kept in touch in many ways, whether I was passing through Victor, Idaho, or not. Right. Uh, he's such an influential person in the industry, and so for a while now, we've been talking just about the opportunity to get together and to do something collaboratively uh, and what that would mean for his brand as well as ours. Um, We were talking about that DIY crowd, you know, a few minutes ago and how that translates to people and who's traveling, who's paying to, Mm -hmm. to bring their bike on a, a, you know, an all inclusive vacation style experience Mm -hmm. like this. Um, And I think that the bike packing realm is, is a, is an area where people are looking more and more for deeper understanding, deeper knowledge. Uh, they want to learn from those who are experts in the industry about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Jay and I were speaking in September about an opportunity this winter to collaborate on an idea. And we said, you know, why don't we host a mix? Let's do a gravel and a back bike packing experience. Oh, cool. Um, and let's, let's give Jay an opportunity to, reach out to, you know, a different demographic or maybe people who are just really interested in him as an athlete, perhaps, Mm -hmm. Um, but have everyone come down to the San Rafael Valley of Arizona uh, in March and uh, spend a week riding endurance miles, but then uh, offer a really fun opportunity on day four uh, Mm -hmm. where we all get up, uh, we pack our bags as if we're leaving on an extended day trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, ride out and then what we'll do is as a group we'll all camp under the stars that night um, right. I will I'll move ahead as as chef and uh, camp leader so to speak and um, I'm, I'm gonna go find a really great place in the dirt for all of us to to spend a night under the stars in and uh, we'll have a beautiful dinner around a campfire and then 
the next morning we'll all pack up again and people will have an opportunity to either ride 75 or 100 miles back to our home base in Patagonia. Cool. It sounds like an awesome, awesome experience. <laughs> we're, we're really excited about it. It'll be unique and different. Uh, we have the opportunity to bring on a few more guests uh, for that week as well. Typ- typically, we uh, can take no more than 10. We like to really keep that group small and intimate, but uh, we feel that you know, the bikepacking demographic might want to gather in a little bit of a larger way. And so we're, we're offering that ability during that week in March. It'll be exciting. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's one thing that really um, kind of attracted me to you guys as you're kind of experimenting with different formats or with uh, demographics that aren't historically like, you know, paying for for um, for like supported tours and stuff, but are kind of pushing that envelope of um, you know, what the next iteration of you know kind of bike businesses is going to be like in the future thank you uh <laughs> it's definitely a topic of conversation around tcm headquarters uh on a regular basis uh how do we how do we push that envelope how do we continue to be different how do we stick out but how do we stick out in in really what is just a form of our own mm-hmm. uh, you know i think uh, the question that often we're asked is how are we different or how are we the same and you know the the opportunity to not really advertise or talk about necessarily a typical schedule is something that really differentiates us versus other touring companies in the industry uh, Heidi and I like I mentioned really just want to invite guests into into our daily lifestyle into who we are and what we do and and that is so community based and rooted that we feel from a vacation standpoint uh, it's really special to send people home with those messages, but also um, offer an ability to ride your bike in in any way that you want, no matter what. Um, and that's that's helpful to have the SAG support every day. But really, it's about uh, looking at you know ten people during a week, and whether those whether all those ten people know each other or not, uh, having the group of people on our on our team. Um, with the ability to manage, you know, someone who has the capabilities of riding a hundred miles f- quickly mm-hmm. or, you know, getting through a hundred mile day in, in any way that they can, uh, and having them end that day feeling absolutely accomplished in ways that they hadn't really realized in themselves as an athlete before. So right. it's, it's special. Cool. I think one thing that attracts Thing behind just a brand name like i feel people get a sense of you know you and heidi and um can connect on some way rather than just like this is the name of our company but there's you get a sense that you kind of know the people that are operating it rather than just going to have another like tour experience with like some amorphous people <laughs> yeah thank you for that it's a huge compliment yeah uh, i think you know social media is such an incredibly large part of all of our lives these days and that it's always a big question you know is this really happening right now right um what what seems so right now and immediate and real uh you're never really sure and so uh, you know every day um or every couple days whenever we're making uh use of social media or putting ourselves on the line to the public or those who follow you know where we are and what we're doing um try our darndest and our best to make it as real as possible all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it just so happens that gravel riding is so freaking rad that <laughs> things do seem like we have a smile of face all the time. But uh, <laughs> no, we de- we definitely have our down times as well. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. What's, I guess, what's the challenge? What's the biggest challenge in, in operating the business? Um, two things. I think, uh, Figuring out how to best bring that DIY and um, adventure-based crowd to one of our events, uh, and that is both financially but also culturally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think those two aspects are tough, and they're hard to blend sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been challenging for us, and we're we're working on it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is lodging. Um, we we want to find places where 
where no one's operating, where, where, where another company, you know, might not have a trip planned for that year. And those are typically in really small places like Patagonia, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these areas aren't, uh, situated or equipped with lodging, uh, for large amounts of people. And, and we're not even a large group. You know, we're talking 15 to 20 people at the most, and that's staff included. Um, so that has been our number one challenge thus far is finding the right place to host our guests, make it comfortable, make it fun and exciting, um, and, and live up to, you know, what we want to provide to people from a, from a five night, six day stay, uh, and, and have them excited about maybe coming back next year. What do you want a guest to walk away with after having done one of your, your camps? Like what's that, you know, like if, if a guest thinks this, then, you know, we've done our job well. It's <laughs> a great question. Uh, two things. Um, one, eating, eating well and uh, having, a, having an understanding of where your food's coming from and why is, is a big reason why we operate. Uh, I, I want to I equip people with simple ways of understanding more about themselves and their nutrition as a healthy athlete. Um, so giving them the tools to go home and find that out uh, from, you know, from any way they can where they live. Uh, but then also uh, the ability to ride their bike whenever they want to for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and at times I think that that means, you know, throwing out the training schedule, uh, maybe forgetting the computer and the cell phone at home. Uh, uh, and just remembering that the bicycle is an incredible way to transform your mind. It's also a beautiful way to uh, decompress and see a place. And uh, if we can send people home feeling uh, just excited about uh, a new way to ride and a new way to look at food, then we've then we've done our jobs. Cool. Well, that's an awesome place to stop. Thank you, Xander, so much for being a guest. And uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. If you guys have any follow-up questions, leave those in the comment section below. I'll try to bug Xander to answer them. And uh, thanks again for joining us and good luck with the business. Thanks, Russ. I really appreciate being here and uh, I hope you have a great 2018. Let's ride. Yeah, totally. Thanks. So thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of PLP Talks. If you enjoyed it, be sure to share it with a friend. And if you're listening through iTunes, don't forget to rate and review. It really helps the show out and we'll talk to you next time.